What is the number one sign of evil? For those who not, did not get my private Periscope session, right? You can follow me on Periscope, and we and on Patreon we do some private things, and I shared this based on the word and experience that the number one sign of evil people is misleading. Is misleading. Evil people mislead other people in a conclusive way. Let me explain that. They mislead people in a conclusive way. They mislead people even in Bible interpretation. This is, here's a dishonest way to read the Bible. Let's say you take one verse. Jesus said, go not to the Gentiles nor into any town of Samaria, but rather go to the house of the lost sheep of Israel. Okay, that's what he said in one place. That's in, in the Gospels. But later on, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then you know what I heard somebody say? He said, oh, Jesus contradicts himself. See, the Bible contradicts itself. That's why I don't believe it. No, you are misleading people in a conclusive way. You're making, conclus you're making a conclusive statement from a non-conclusive statement. Does that make sense? I mean, it's common in our life to make non-conclusive statements. You might ask me, are you hungry? I say, no, I'm, I, I don't want to eat now. I'm not hungry right now. Later on, two hours later, you say, hey, you want to go out and eat? I say, yeah, man, I'm famished. I'd like to eat right now. Oh, you contradict yourself. No, you're misleading people and you're evil if you do that. Context matters in interpreting the Bible. Timing matters. Did Jesus say something at the beginning of his ministry or after he died and resurrected from the dead? It's obvious to anyone who's reasonable that one statement is now conclusive, other statements are not conclusive. But evil people will mislead you in a conclusive way. God does not see one-time activity as your lifetime identity. He said that very clearly to me. He does not see one-time activity as your lifetime identity. He does not see a temporary action as your permanent identity. That's not how God sees us. And it's actually very hard to make conclusive statements about people because their lives are not over. It's why it's wrong for you to hold unforgiveness in your heart towards somebody because that somebody could have done wrong, recognized it, repented before God, now God says, I've cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. It's gone. That means between him or her and God, it's now clear. And you are the one living in sin. You're the one living in sin because of bitterness, unforgiveness. You're now believing, seducing spirits. And you can even feel righteous about sinning because your sin is in the heart and their sin might be fleshly, external, visible. You see how the devil is so clever and he creates a river of filth. Do you know that? You know there's a river of life that comes from the throne room of God? Do you know that God showed a woman, a godly woman, a river of filth? I'm going to read it to you. This is from a book called Heaven Awaits the Bride and the author is called Anna Roundtree. I'm going to read to you about the river of filth. The river of filth. Boy, I'd never, never heard of such a thing, but I can believe, I can believe that the devil has a copy, a counterfeit of everything. If rivers of life flow out of the righteous, rivers of filth flow out of the unrighteous. Well, Jesus brought her to this place. The water boiled and emitted steam every time he plunged his staff into it. Jesus said, this is the river of filth. As the river of life is clear, so this one is putrid and defiling. It issues from the mouths of sinful man. My goodness, turn on social media and see the river of filth coming out of the mouths, coming out of the keyboards of sinful man. As rivers of living water came from the belly of my righteous ones, so out of the blackened heart through the mouth come this watery filth. I could see creatures lying on the banks and hear them breathing. They appeared to be crocodiles, but they were blowing sounds through their nostrils like hippos. 
Their eyes shone in the dark. The demons uttered low, guttural chuckles at the obvious pain of those in prison. They enjoyed someone else's pain. Let me tell you something. If you enjoy somebody else's pain, you are of the devil. You are. And you can cloak everything in religious garb and religious language, but it is really satanic. It's the worst stuff that God hates, that Jesus hates. Observe the misery, the Lord said. My people participate in this, enjoying the downfall of another, laughing at the mistake of others, and holding them in their chains instead of setting them free. The fleshly use of a Christian's tongue is demonic, whether he is cursing others or attempting to speak wisdom. James chapter 3, verse 6, 9, and 15. He speaks out of his earthly self, and he seeks his own glory, and so gives Satan the right to use him. There's always one ditch or the other ditch. You can use your mouth in a fleshly way to criticize or in a fleshly way to show how wise and how better you are. Both are filthy to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's of the flesh. It's time that we spend more time with the Holy Spirit. It's time that we pray and get close to Him because we're living in the last days. And the river of filth is going to get dirtier and wider and more people are going to jump into it. They'll be tormented in it. But there's a river of life, and he's inviting us to come to the river of life, and then out of our own bellies, we should issue out living water. The Lord showed this to her. After some worship, there was worship in heaven towards the Lord. After a long pause, the song, there was a long pause after the song ended. Finally, he spoke. Before the cock crows, Anna, Remember this? Before the cock crows, Peter. Before the cock crows, body of Christ. Three stages of betrayal will, be, will have been accomplished against me in the world. Betrayal is multiplying, and many will be seduced by their own fear or their need for survival, and they will betray to save themselves. If you have such an impetus to do things to save yourself, to help yourself, to justify yourself, this is giving yourself over to the devil because you need to trust God and he will tell you what to do. Are you interested in the three stages of betrayal? Three stages of betrayal of the Lord as portrayed by Judas are number one, those who pretend to be his disciples but secretly love the things of the world. That's in John 12, verse 6. Number two, those who secretly consort with his enemies. That's in Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 to 16. Number three, those who openly side with his enemies. Matthew 26, verses 47 to 49. Let me t tell you again, the three stages of betrayal. Some will come to church and pretend to be his disciples, but they secretly love the things of the world, that rather spend more time with the world than with God. God sees that. Every time I read a testimony about heaven, by the way, I love the honesty of God. He pulls no punches. He speaks to you just like you are. You come before him, and he says, you've been a coward. You've been fearful. You've been disobedient. He just says it the way it is. And you're like, wow, I thought it was hidden. But it is the way it is. He will just, he knows us. He knows everything about us. And Jesus said, in the way that Jezebel did it, in the way that Delilah did it, in the way that Judas did it, people in church will do it in the last days. Are we talking about end time, church? You like an end time sermon? I got you a new one. I got 500 hours of unique sermons, never repeated myself. In, in nearly 20 years, I have not really re I've not repeated any sermon in its entirety. If you're in your call, God will keep giving you fresh manna for your call. Laban, 
Jacob's, Jacob's uncle, the father of his wives, was a misleading person. He said, work, work for me for seven years, then I'll give you Rachel. On the night of the wedding, he changed the terms and said, well, it's not in our way to give the younger daughter before the older. What are you doing? Misleading. When you meet a person like that, you know, get out of town, get away from that person. They're not reasonable. They're evil people. He changed the wages of Jacob ten times. He was unreasonable, unpersuadable, not open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And Satan is the worst example. He is the worst misleading character. Everything he says is misleading. The first sentence he says to Eve was misleading. He didn't tell the truth to Eve. He misled her and said, if you disobey God, you won't die. What a lie. What a lie. And what a hypocrite, because he'd already been through it. What a hypocrite. Lying in hypocrisy is the telltale sign of evil. If you look out for this trait in evil people, it will save you great pain. In this day and age, especially among the millennials, people are loath to call evil what it is. They see evil and they say, I don't want to judge. Like you're being good, you're being kind. They excuse evil. They make peace with evil. They walk with evil. And then they pretend, oh, well, those, those protesters, those lying reporters, they're okay, they mean well. No, some people don't mean well. Can you tell the difference? Some people mean harm. Some people are like Jezebel against Naboth. Now, I should say, I should add, I don't believe everyone who misleads is evil. I don't believe that. I believe that there's some people who are just misguided. They themselves are misled, and so they say misleading things without knowing. When you know the Lord is near, become more and more reasonable. Let everyone know that you're easy to reason with. Have you met people that cannot be reasoned with? It's so difficult, you tell them, no, this is really what I believe. Oh, this is really what happened from my perspective. And they refuse to talk. They cannot, no one can talk to them. They will not be convinced. They are not persuadable. What is that kind of wisdom? It's devilish. It's demonic. In fact, Paul prayed, and we should pray. In fact, we should pray for ministers to be delivered. I wonder if we pray enough this way. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2. Paul asked, so I asked, I asked of all my reasonable listeners, do as Paul said. Pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. Well, you know, in English, wicked and evil, they're synonymous. That doesn't tell us very much, does it? Listen to this in the King James. Pray that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Who are the wicked and the evil? The people who cannot be reasoned with. They're unreasonable people. Let's say, you get this. Now, I'm going to bring it home because this happens a lot more than anyone in the church will admit. Let's say you're talking about the book of Job. And somebody says to you, well, you're sick and you have to stay sick because Job in the Bible was sick. Well, you're speaking something conclusively about Job, which isn't true. Job's story did not conclude with him staying sick. In fact, it concluded with him actually getting healed. Not only could he be healed, the Bible specifically says he could pray for his false accusers to be healed. Do you know that if you falsely accuse people, you'll get sick? And the only way to get healed is if the person you accuse prays for you. It's the only way, according to the book of Job. There are so many instances of healing through different means and methods in the Bible. And Job is one of them. So if you're honest 
as a Christian, as a Bible interpreter about the story of Job, you would have to say that if a person was like Job, then in the end, at the conclusion, that person must be healed like Job. But if you speak conclusively about Job's sickness, you are misleading Christians. You're leading them through a seducing spirit. It seems so much like the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? But how can you distinguish the difference? The number one sign of evil people is they mislead in a conclusive way. Another biblical case would be King David. If someone were to say to you, King David was an adulterer. And if they said that in a conclusive way, that would be misleading. How can a one-time event in one person's life identify who he is for the rest of his life? Wouldn't that be lying in hypocrisy? Because if we defined you by a one-time event that happened in your life, you'd be done for. You would be undone. Isn't that right? And yet these people are able to teach such false doctrine about a one-time event in someone's life. One-time activity does not make lifetime identity, God told me. God didn't call David a wicked sinner for the rest of his life. In fact, God actually called David a man after God's own heart and used David as a model, as a prototype for good kings for the rest of the royal dynasty. God said of any king that was good that he walked in the ways of his father David. Do you know that Lying media said this about Donald Trump when they said, how are you preparing? How are you preparing for the summit? Remember the the Singapore summit where he met with Kim Jong-un? Something that no other president was able to do for 70 years because Donald Trump has been gifted by God with a skill to negotiate. It's his gift. Read the art of the deal and you'll know what he's doing. He told you in the book. So he answered and said to the reporter, he says, well, you know, I, 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 I'm prepared, like I'm born prepared. I'm prepared, I'm preparing all the time. I'm not quoting him verbatim, okay? It's like we say we live a prepared life. We live a prayed up life. Donald Trump answered and said, I'm always prepared. I'm preparing all the time. Now, what did he mean? You know what he means if you read The Art of the Deal. You know what the reporters say? They put headline, Kim Jong-un is more prepared than Donald Trump. How are you preparing, Donald Trump? Did you prepare when you were in Playboy magazine? Did you prepare when you, you know, I don't know, groped some woman that accused her of groping her? Did you prepare by doing those things? Well, wait a second, this has got nothing to do with the summit. You are misleading someone in a conclusive way. You know, these things happen, you're talking about 20, 30, 40 years ago. And we're talking about him bringing the art of the deal, the negotiation skill to the table, which he successfully did. But they speak something of the past, and they try to make a conclusion about him in the present. These people criticize Trump. You can't influence Trump that way anyway. One thing, if you do read the art of the deal, I want to tell you one thing about Trump. One thing that is amazing about Trump makes him more Christian than most Christians. And pastors have told me who have met with him in in prayer, I haven't seen Trump personally, so I can only get to the next closest thing, pastors who pray with him. They say, he is born again. He got saved. But you know, even years before he got saved, back in the 80s, back when he was younger than me, by the way, when he wrote The Art of the Deal, he was younger than me. That photo of him on The Art of the Deal is younger than me. Even back then, he wrote in The Art of the Deal that he has no problem working with enemies. Show me a Christian who's got that kind of ability, that reconciliatory tone and attitude. Never had a problem. In fact, he he said that over the years, when he sees somebody give him a lot of problem and, and he had to fight them after it's all over, many times he hires them. He saw they had talent. They fought the wrong guy because he'll never give up. He'll fight everybody in court till he wins. But then he'll even hire them. 
give him a chance. That's why he is able, it's, it's second nature to him to go toe-to-toe with Kim Jong-un, not promise him anything, didn't give him anything, and in exchange got tons of promises out of him. The world's had no nuclear testing, no missile shot over South Korea or Japan. Who else can get that? You don't think God wants that on the earth? You think God wants a nuclear bomb to, to explode in Japan? No, this took somebody very skilled and very reconciliatory to be able to meet an enemy. And the shame is, the world is able to do it. Trump was able to do it before he got saved. And most Christians can't do it. Most Christians can't talk to somebody. People can change. People can grow. You can't say David is an adulterer in a conclusive way because God did not see one-time adultery as his lifetime identity. You can't say Donald Trump is an adulterer in a conclusive way about this person. He's been married 13 years to Melania Trump. They have a son, Barron Trump. And as far as I know, he had no girlfriends in the White House like JFK, like Bill Clinton. Yet the critics try to force him to live by a past mistake. And so-called Christians do this. They hate me because they hate Donald Trump. And because I believe that prophetically God can use an imperfect man like Donald Trump, they end up hating me as well. It's a seducing spirit that has grabbed hold of the mind and the, the hearts of these people. And they think they're doing a righteous work, but they're not by criticizing a man that God is using. So you can't force people to live by a past mistake. It's not constructive criticism. It's not even fair criticism. It's evil criticism.